ocean freight. It's got to be one of the biggest challenges over the last couple of years in supply chain. That is the topic for this week, coming right up. So ocean freight challenges. What I'd really like to do this week uh, is to give you a little bit of a an update on what's going on in the industry sector, uh, some tips on how you can manage your ocean freight challenges, uh, and some access to further resources. Now, I could just sit here and talk about that, but I'm going to do something even better uh, because we've just done a webinar on that, and it was with one of our ocean freight specialists, Trent Morris. So I thought, let's just share that. We don't normally share webinars, our, our Logistics Bureau webinars here on the channel, but I thought, why not? Uh, because this is exactly what you need right now. So at the end of the, uh, the webinar recording, I'll share some more information for you as well. Let's get right on to it. So good morning and welcome everybody. Let's get things underway. Great to have you join us today and uh, for our first webinar in a very, very long time. So my apologies for that. Uh, but we have a great session today looking at ocean freight for you uh, with our specialist on the topic, Trent Morris, who will be joining us in just a second. So great to have you join us. If you haven't been on these webinars before, um, this one's going to run for about 30 or 40 minutes and just have a look at the right of your screen. You can see the control panel there. I'll just point to that on my screen. Uh, feel free to ask questions at any time through the webinar in that panel over there. OK, so our topic today is ocean freight. Particularly topical, of course, because it's probably been the major drama that uh, we've seen in supply chain over the last couple of years. And basically, we're going to be going through a, a brief industry update. We're going to be looking at some of the ocean freight challenges that everybody is facing at the moment. Um, and we're going to do a mini case study to show you how people are getting around some of these problems. Um, and then, of course, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. And our guest speaker today is Trent Morris. Uh, Trent is one of our specialist consultants who uh, specializes in ocean freight. He's been helping clients through the last couple of years with their ocean freight challenges. So he's got lots of great tips to share. So thank you for joining us, Trent. And just by uh, way of telling you the, the sort of outline of the webinar today, uh, basically, we will be taking questions through the webinar. So do find the question box or the chat box. You can put questions in there anytime that you like. Uh, we'll also have a Q&A session at the end. And if you are used to our webinars, you'll know that we also have some gifts for you at the end. So do make sure you hang on right till the end. So for those of you who haven't been to one of Logistics Bureau's webinars before, I'm going to give you like 30 seconds on who we are. Uh, we are basically a management consulting company, our headquarters in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we help companies all over the world uh, and major challenges, of course, like ocean freight, uh, but also everything that you can imagine in supply chain and logistics. Um, and we currently have projects underway in so many different countries in, uh, in Vietnam, in, in uh, Malaysia, in Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Dubai, South America, in Argentina. Uh, so we have a lot of fun doing what we do. And these are the sort of areas that we've been working in through COVID. Now, as part of the industry update, Trent's going to be giving us an update shortly in terms of what's happening with ocean freight. Uh, but we published a week or two back uh, also a much broader industry update. So I'll draw your attention to that. You may want to have a look at that if you haven't already. Just go to logisticsbureau.com forward slash blog uh, and you'll find this update that was published a couple of weeks ago. It's fairly extensive and gives you an idea of all the sorts of challenges that are going on in supply chain at the moment uh, and we'll be publishing that quarterly. Uh, you'll notice this snapshot here of our blog page. If you go in there and have a look at that article, uh, you can see you can actually subscribe here to the blog. So just pop your details in there and every time new articles and things get published, you'll be notified. So it's, it's, it's a massive resource, actually. There's thousands of articles in there, well worth having a look at. 
but we are here to talk about ocean freight. So uh, Trent, do come on the line, show yourself. This is where we find now, this is six o'clock in the morning here. So this is where we find, has Trent woken up? He has. <laughs> I am awake. <laughs> He's awake and he's here. And thank and you for, for giving up at this hour of the morning, Trent. Um, we we actually run these webinars twice. So for us, it's six o'clock in the morning and and then two p.m. Uh, and the reason that we do that is so that we can reach as broad an audience as possible. Uh, if we only did it, you know, at a comfortable time for us, there'd be lots of people around the world who couldn't join in. So uh, thank you, Trent, for getting up at the crack of dawn. And uh, at that point, I think, uh, are you ready to share your screen and, and take us through the materials? Excellent. All right. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. And uh, yeah, it's been a rather controversial and tumultuous couple of years in Ocean Freight. So what I thought I'd do is I'd just go back and do a quick timeline for those who haven't had a chance to do any investigation. Um, I, I've done this at the, given a few supply chain directors and so forth, this for a C-level brief so they understand exactly what's happening. So basically, uh, as you would know, uh, up until 2019, it was relatively smooth sailing, uh, pun intended, for uh, for the ocean freight industry. Uh, then in January 2020, we started to see the COVID lockdowns happen, COVID-19 happen, uh, starting with the Shanghai lockdown in, in uh, 24th of January 2020. Then in February 2020, we saw the air freight scene lockdown as well, specifically passenger air freight, and that moved 1.4 million TU worth of uh, goods from air freight to ocean freight over the following 12 months, uh, and that obviously had a huge uh, added a huge burden 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 it to an already overstressed ocean freight scenario. In July 2020, we started to see significant schedule liability uh, issues starting to take place, uh, and they dropped down to about. 30% average, and I'll show that chart in a second, but really uh, some shipping lines were down at least to the 6% mark. In August 2020, we saw a uh, peak demand come forward uh, by at least a month that we hadn't really experienced before. And that was primarily driven by the big retailers globally who had started to put in their orders to ensure that uh, they would get their product in time for Christmas. March 2021, no one will forget the ever given, uh, how one ship can disrupt uh, the global supply chain. That ship, uh, the ever given, the, basically the, the flow and effect of that wasn't really clear of the Suez Canal until June 2021. And that obviously had a huge impact on uh, the international supply chain as well. Following the ever given, <clears throat> in May 2021, we started to see charter vessels the price of charter vessels actually doubled from where it had been 12 months before. Uh, and that doubling, so the charter, day charter of a vessel of around 8,500 TU capacity is about 50,000, or was about 50,000. It doubled up to about 100,000 and it peaked around October, November 2021 at $120,000 a day uh, for charter vessels. And so carriers like uh, your ANLs and so forth, who run exclusively a charter fleet, had a huge impact there. And even vessels that uh, correction carriers that used charter vessels to manage peak season uh, demand uh, were at a serious disadvantage and either paid it and therefore passed it on or didn't take on charter vessels and reduce capacity. And then finally, August 2021, same challenge as 2020, lots of cash in the market, no one was traveling, no services were being procured on the whole. And so we start to see these compounding effects so that by the time we get to November 2021, uh, the ocean freight industry was at a, an all-time low with respect to uh, uh, service reliability, but also at all-time high from a cost perspective. So if we just have a quick look at what it looked like at the end of 2021. Um, so I'll, I'll, everything that I'm going to be talking about today come from uh, industry journals and, and other publicly available websites. Um, I'm, there's quite a few that I'm a big fan of. Uh, sea Intelligence, uh, Splash 24-7. Uh, Zanetta, Drury, etc. Um, if anyone's interested in those types of things that I, I subscribe to and I read on a regular basis, please feel free to connect, reach out via LinkedIn and connect with me, and uh, and I can DM you some of the uh, the publications that I'm, I uh, I read and and uh, and subscribing to. Uh, Jock, uh, journalofofficecommerce.com, uh, lodestar.com.uk. There's a few out there that are very very good for this type of info. So as you can see here. This screen line is 2020. In uh, July, we start to see this big dive down here 
to the 40% uh, mark, and then it stabilizes through 2021 at just over 30%. Now, that's an industry average. Uh, obviously, as I said, some of the carriers were reporting lows as low as 6% schedule reliability, uh, which is tough to plan. Uh, then on the opposite side, you also got this delay late, uh, day, days delay uh, for late vessel arrivals. Uh, once again, it starts to skyrocket during 2021 and it sits up here around the five to seven mark uh, throughout all of 2021. Now, the interesting thing about that is that's predominantly caused by blank sailings. So vessels sitting offshore waiting for birth and then they get rescheduled and, and, and uh, not called a port at all uh, to try and catch up that schedule reliability. And, and a question we got asked this morning was around that specific thing and, and I'll deal with that as we go. Um, but really, schedule reliability was at an all-time low and as uh, delayed days were an all-time high. So as you can see here, this is a great chart from Drury. Um, you'll notice here that really this, this chart should go back, or I wish it went back to 2008. 2006, 2007 were both record years at the time. Uh, they're about a third of what they are currently uh, for the shipping industry. Uh, some of the big sh shipping lines were showing net, you know, record net profits of $600 million, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but then in 2008 at the GFC, we saw that big crash uh, at, in 2008, uh, beginning of 2009, and the shipping industry never really recovered. Here you'll see this dive below 2000 with yeah, this whole period here, you'll notice that they're below 0% EBIT. So the shipping industry has done it very tough for a very long time, mostly because they commoditized themselves uh, and just had a rate war following the GFC to try and secure uh, vessel uh, bookings so that they could help pay for things like um, birthing fees and fuel, et cetera. But they did it very tough for a very long period of time. 2016 was probably the lowest year that they had. This was the year that Hanjin went under uh, and all of the shipping lines started to consolidate into their new consortiums, the 2M consortium, One Network, et cetera. Um, so this was a tough time for shipping lines. Uh, interestingly enough, at the beginning of 2020, we actually published an article saying that the shipping lines have already done the hard work and that you should start looking at locking your rates as early as possible. Uh, and that obviously proved true because here you'll see in 2020, we start this big climb up to the peak in, in uh, Q2, uh, uh, Q3 2021. But note that they are hitting around the 50% EBIT at the moment, which is, uh, that's, that's great profitability for them. It's a pain for the rest of us, um, but uh, that is certainly helping them fill their cash books for this negative period back here. And this, this is interesting. I hear a lot of people saying that, you know, we as the buyers have got long memories. Well, evidently so of the shipping lines because they're remembering the years that we put them through the pain of negative EBIT. Um, so yeah, so look, I, obviously I always, uh, talk caution when I'm talking about um, uh, procuring services from carriers. <clears throat> so we have a look, this is the Freitas Baltic Index. This was taken from Splash 24-7. Uh, One of our subscribers set this to us. It's a very, very, uh, it's a very helpful slide. It shows what the, what the situation is. So last year we saw this increasing climb uh, where the rates basically tripled over, over the 12 months, uh, correction over the six months. They started at 75, they peaked up here over Christmas, uh, November, December, and then it started this gradual decline. So what we what we believe and, and what I certainly have read and, and researched demonstrates why that's declining is primarily around the fact that the, the a lot of the big retailers on the back of softening demand have started releasing capacity back to the market. So if you get a big retailer that moves 100,000, 200,000 TU, and, uh, and they only need you know, they redo their forecast. They only need 160,000 as an example. They've released 40,000 to you back into the market. That will obviously then go into the spot market, which increases supply and therefore supply and demand balance out. Um, so that's the that's the that's one of the major reasons. We're also seeing because of that softening demand is caused by the potential that we're seeing at the moment for a global recession. Uh, the Obviously the politicians are all hesitant to say anything about that, but we are definitely seeing people not spending as much um, and uh, and that's been caused by these concerns around the world about the fact that we are heading into a recession, well potentially heading into a recession. Uh, obviously global air freight is back on the cards and that's starting to increase. We're not back at where we were pre-pandemic levels but a lot of the volume has started moving back. 
Plus the volatility, volatility within the supply chain means that people are air freighting more than they want to, um, just simply because the service reliability in the ocean is meaning that they have to, to ensure they've got the goods to sell that they need. And then finally, um, we are also seeing an easing of port restrictions or port congestion burdens, uh, which is helping schedule reliability. And every time you get better schedule reliability, just say, for example, on a string that's 30 days long, if you can, you know, and it's blown out to 38 to 40 days, if you can come back to 30, obviously that's one, essentially one extra vessel that's being added in on every cycle. And that just naturally increases capacity. Uh, which means that there is more supply in the market and uh, there's less capacity constraints. So as you think about the reduction in cost that's being driven in this market, now, first of all, most companies, that, at least that we have a relationship with, do have fixed rates over the 12 month period. Um, and I, uh, I would hesitate to uh, consider breaching that contract because of what I'm going to talk about now. Uh, but if you do have some spare capacity, it's always good to jump in the, shit, in the spot market and see if you can offside those, offset those costs a little. But there is still risk in the market. And so we're not expecting to see a recovery until uh, late Q1 2023 or even Q2 2023. Um, we are expecting prices to go up. Uh, into peak season. So speaking to the carriers, they're starting to see that slight reversal of, um, of costs. Uh, certainly capacity is 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 better. Their, their service restraints are less, so there's less congestion that they're dealing with, though it still is out there. Um, but at the end of the day, that's all helping the cost, but still, you know, as we get closer to, to peak season, demand is going to go up. Supply constraints remain equal, and therefore we are expecting costs to go back up to roughly equivalent to where they were uh, last year, though I doubt it will peak as high around that $10,000 per TU index mark. Some of the, the things that we're concerned about, obviously the Ukraine war is into its 160 or so day, um, and that's having a, a global impact. Uh, there has been news of uh, both parties, both the Western parties and, and Russian parties, um, sort of seizing vessels and, and that's causing issues in, in Europe or at least not seizing necessarily, but you know, harassing vessels, uh, which is making people hesitant to be sailing in that Baltic and, and Northern Seas area. Um, China is still experiencing rolling lockdowns and they have a zero COVID policy. So that's gonna continue impacting that. Um, and then we're also starting to really feel the impact at the other end. So as the China uh, and Southeast Asia generally, as the impacts in Southeast Asia start to lessen, that will move product through their ports more efficiently, but that then, like a bullwhip effect, has an issue at the destination. So we're still seeing big issues in, in North America. We're still seeing big issues in uh, New Zealand, some in Australia, uh, and that's caused both by that massive flow of goods, but also uh, industrial action in a lot of these big ports as well. Um, we are starting, uh, there has been a slight softening, softening of the oil price, but it's, uh, it's still very high compared to where it was pre-COVID. Uh, and then finally, the one that people need to consider for their long term is the regulatory changes they're looking at with respect to sulphur, uh, noise pollution and the effect it has on, on oceanic wildlife, etc. So there's a lot of things that are coming there that, uh, that we as, as shipping professionals need to be concerned about. So Rob, we might take a quick break and if you have any questions or we want to go to those polls. Yeah, good idea. We've got a question just coming in now. Uh, I think for the past couple of years showed that bigger players stand a much better chance of securing space. Is there anything that smaller players can do? Oh, that's an excellent question. But if you'll indulge me, I'll actually answer it in the next start in the next slide. Okay, well, we might just throw up a poll uh, and see if we can manage to do this without having another technical glitch. Um, so are you involved directly in buying or managing ocean freight? Do tap your answers in there. And I'll just give you a couple of minutes and we've got them coming in. Whilst you're uh, tapping in those answers, my apologies again for the technical glitch at the beginning, but we will have a recording from this morning's webinar that we can show you. So don't worry. You missed the first couple of minutes. You'll be getting it back. Am I going to close the poll in three, two, one? There we go. And now I'm going to share the result. So yeah, about 60% of people on online here are involved directly uh, in buying sea freight. 
Excellent. All right. Well, you guys are going to be very interested about what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, all right. So, so tips and insights. So these are the things that we've seen over the last two and a half to three years, or at least since um, the beginning of 2020. The very first thing you can do is get close to the carriers. Um, you know, you don't have to be a huge mover of volume to have a relationship with the carrier. And even if you're buying through a freight forwarder, I still do recommend having a relationship with the carrier. Now, the reason for that is simple because they are at the end of the day, the freight forwarder is selling space on their vessel. Uh, and, at the end, and, and so the shipping line has the final say on who gets space and who doesn't. However, from our own work that we've done with clients over this last year uh, or two, we're seeing that on average companies that are buying directly from the shipping lines, and, and this actually goes back, this is historical, this is the reason for this. In 2016, while the shipping lines were showing their lowest ever negative EBIT, at the same time, the freight forwarders were showing record profits. And so a lot of the carriers started moving away from a freight forwarding preferencing model. Uh, and a lot of them developed their own internal logistics systems, MERS, OCL, and a few others. Uh, not that that was ever new, obviously they've all done that in the past, but it really became a preference for them. Um, and so uh, whilst I would never say that a freight forwarder isn't a good option, and it is in a lot of cases, um, if you get can get close to the carrier, have joint meetings with your freight forwarder as an example, we're seeing that companies that have that have on average 11.5% cheaper ocean freight than those who are buying through the freight forwarders. So on a $10,000 um, on a $10,000 container, that's going to give you a saving straight up of over a thousand dollars. And the that's other a reason why you want to get question, Trent. Let's yep. just see how many people are actually dealing direct with carriers. So do you currently negotiate direct with carriers? Yes or no? Be interesting to see this result. I will give you. Uh, a few seconds on that. I'll give you five, four, three, two, one. And let's just have a quick look at the result. Uh, 22, 21% are, that's all, that's all. Mm. Yeah, and that's that's fairly normal because uh, most people, it's so easy to work through a freight forwarder because they've got all of the systems that you need to be successful in your ocean freight. And I, I believe that they've got a very important part to play. However, as I said, I would still get Quick close. On in here, Trent, sorry to jump in, mate. Um, what if our shipping terms are CFR, CIF? More difficult, more difficult, unless you're an exporter. If you're an exporter, then it's perfect. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it, it is more difficult there to, to get those involved, but you need to make sure that your vendor, now if you're buying on CFR, CIF, DAT, DAP, et cetera, then you're probably buying from, potentially from a larger supplier who has better ocean freight negotiation than you do, in which case you need to be making sure that they are doing the right thing. Uh, and, but it is difficult to control the costs if you're buying on C terms. Um, so yes, but you know, that's that's one that maybe we can talk about offline if someone wants to DM me uh, through LinkedIn. But yeah, it, it, you need to be buying on F terms or or uh, or Xworks, FCA, um, FOB, FAS, etc. to really take advantage of those costs. Um, okay, so and then by buying from the carriers directly, the, on average, our clients are seeing a 25% better um, allocation of capacity uh, than if they're buying through freight forwarders. Now, there's two reasons for that. Basically, you know, they the shipping lines will only give you the rates if they can give you the volume, whereas the freight forwarders got the luxury of shopping around and trying to find uh, freight on vessels, and that also attributes, uh, sorry, gives you an idea of why there's a there's a, a cheaper rate there as well. Um, but I do certainly recommend, even if you are working with freight forwarders, get close to the shipping lines in conjunction with the freight forwarder that you're working with. Um, one of the big ones that uh, that has really become uh, a challenge for a lot of clients is the fact that we've come out of a period where freight rates were extraordinarily low. And so often to get better operational usage of a container cost more money than what it was worth. If you're paying $2,000 a container, you're not going to pay $800 to send all your freight through a CFS to then 
you know, make sure the container's full because it just wouldn't make sense. However, the moment that costs started to rise, a, there's a huge, becomes a huge benefit in, uh, in making sure that every single asset that's moving is fully utilized. And we're seeing on average between 10 and a half and 14 and a half percent savings uh, by by actually doing that exact thing, just making sure every container is actually full. So some of the things you need to do there is make sure that your master data is correct. So if you're ordering FCLs, you know, work out you know what the uh, what what you your freight forwarder or your shipping line recommends as the total capacity of that, and then make sure that your orders with suppliers are matching that volume or weight capacity. Second thing is consider how many containers are moving. So very simply, by, by ensuring that every container is full, you're naturally gonna use less containers. But more importantly, if you actually look at using your higher yield containers and maximizing the use of those higher yield containers, uh, you're gonna see a dramatic difference. So we did some work recently for a client uh, and of the on a couple of trade lanes, they were moving about 2,000 TU. Uh, and when we actually went through and did the numbers, the total number of containers drop down to about 700 containers by optimizing the use of 40 foot high cubes. That has a twofold effect. First of all, it's cheaper because you're using less containers overall, uh, both from a actual shipping perspective, but also from a cartage perspective at origin and destination. Plus with one of the big buzzwords at the moment being carbon management, uh, then by moving less containers, you're having a bigger, uh, sorry, a lower impact on the environment from a, from a carbon perspective. And additionally, it's safer because you've got less truck movements at each end. Uh, so that's obviously all benefits of optimizing the use of containers and making sure you're using the right container split, i.e. making sure you've got more 40 foot, 40 foot high cube containers. It's typical savings that we're seeing there by bringing, trying to get everything in, everything into the 40 foot and 40 foot high cube containers, specifically the high cube containers. We're seeing huge savings between 23 and 37% uh, in that particular area. And then finally, uh, it's very easy with, with ocean frame being so loud and boisterous at the moment, uh, it's very easy to forget that the real savings in any supply chain come by looking at the end to end process. So for example, can you implement some sort of staging area halfway that allows your smaller areas to be uh, purchasing small orders and consolidate those with other orders? Um, can we look at ways of doing the allocation of goods at origin so I can just simply hit a cross stock at destination and go direct to store? There's all sorts of ways that you can optimise uh, or minimise your cost by optimising the movement or the operational movement of freight. And uh, by ensuring a network is optimised, we're seeing upwards of 25 right up to 43% uh, savings against the total cost of supply chain because ocean freight is so high. Once again, if ocean freight is cheaper, it's not as relevant, but uh, it's always good to ensure that it's optimized because you're not only optimizing cost, but you're also minimizing environmental impact and safety issues. And then finally, the thing that we're starting to hear a lot of, and there's a really good article uh, just recently uh, published in, uh, I think it was Splash 24 seven, I'll need to check that, but uh, is a lot of companies are starting to reconsider things like nearshoring and onshoring. So nearshoring is typically a country that is very close nearby. So if you think Australia, New Zealand, that would be nearshoring, uh, or else in the case of North America or Europe, it would be looking at a country that is uh, available by rail or road rather than, um, rather than you know, across oceanic transits. Onshoring is in country itself. And we're starting to see a lot of companies uh, look at that as a long-term strategy to mitigate those costs. Uh, obviously setting up new manufacturing in-house is expensive uh, and therefore needs to be taken into consideration amongst the overall business strategy uh, from a supply chain perspective. But essentially uh, these are things that you can look at knowing that it's unlikely to go back to the glory days of 2016 and thereabouts. Uh, we are expecting it to settle somewhere around the uh, on the index somewhere around the three to four thousand dollars per F mark uh, which in Australia and New Zealand I think Rob said a lot of our uh, people joining us today from Australia and New Zealand would mean that it's going to be around the two thousand dollar mark for a 20 foot container price is probably similar to what we were seeing in 2007 uh, rather than 2017 
Okay, Rob, do we have any more poll questions before I go into the case study? No, I think let's uh, dive no, into that. We've going. got some questions coming in for the end. All right, no worries. So the case study, we have a, one of our clients is a global retailer. Um, they were moving approximately 5,000 TU, origins typically in Asia and South Asia, uh, and they had destinations in Oceania, being Australia, New Zealand, North America, and Europe. Their costs between 2019 and 2021 uh, had gone up 512% for ocean freight and related logistics. So the process that we followed was to make sure that they, and therefore we, understood all of the inputs. Yeah, it's not just about port to port costs. They're, you know, you need to take into consideration INCO terms. Are the INCO terms correct? Are you looking at costs at every element of the supply chain? Is your master data right so that you are you can get those orders correct from a FCL perspective. You know, uh, is your freight forwarder, if you're working with one fully engaged in consolidating and are they controlling the process? Do you have SOPs written with them to give them some authority in the process, et cetera? So we understand all the inputs. The next step is to create the right strategy. And, and this particular company had been working with freight forwarders for many years. Uh, and they, uh, you know, through the through the decade of, of the teens, uh, they had provided a very good service. There was no issues there, but with rising costs, there were some concerns around the strategy that they were uh, they were following and deciding whether or not it was the right strategy for them. So we started collaborating with service providers. So the, if you think about the way most companies typically go to tender, uh, sorry, source, do a sourcing exercise, it's a tender, whether it's an RFP or an RFQ or, or an RFT, whatever it happens to be, um, but it's a tender. And that's one of 64 different ways recommended for sourcing activities by uh, global procurement experts. If you look at all 64, they kind of look like a chessboard. And so you need to consider how do you manipulate the market so that you're getting the best out of every step. So we typically like to look at things from a collaborative perspective. We like to look at things from a total value chain perspective. Yes, we want to you know, end up with some sort of RFT process, but we only want to be talking to companies that actually can provide the service we need. And are not only that, but they're willing to, to write it into the contract when we start finding savings and operational improvements etc so we collaborate with all the service providers making sure that they are fully engaged in the process from the start so the savings we saw we did move to a carrier direct model uh, and right up there was a 10.2 percent saving against what the freight border market had been able to offer uh, so 10.2 percent on a 512 percent increase uh, was a reasonably substantial amount of money for this particular company the next step was we investigated all of the shipments that had been in the previous 12 months and we looked at the forecast for the coming 12 months and after making sure the master data was correct, we identified the opportunities for consolidation uh, between vendors, between cities, whether or not there was opportunities for looking at multi-country consolidation hubs, et cetera. And we found another 11.5% in savings uh, through their consolidation model and making sure that they were optimizing the use of every container and they were optimizing the use of 40 foot high cubes. And then finally, when we actually looked at the overall network, uh, we realized that a lot of the product didn't need to come through a centralized warehouse. It could be uh, picked and packed at origin for destination store. And so it was able to come into a cross stock and just flow out directly from the cross stock. Once again, improving container utilization and reducing the costs of transport uh, and warehousing at destination. And there was another 15% savings there. So overall, uh, by looking at it in a, end-to-end -end sense and, and not getting caught up in the, the detail of the ocean freight moment uh, and implementing the right strategy and collaborating with service providers, uh, they were able to find a 35.7% saving against where they had been previously with a freight forwarder direct model. So thank you very much for that. We'll, uh, we'll come to some questions. We've got lots of uh, questions coming in here. Uh, let me just do a couple of admin points before we come to the questions. Uh, first of all, um, for further information, do go to our blog, logisticsbureau.com forward slash blog. Uh, and I mentioned right at the beginning that uh, we have quite an extensive article on there about all of the changes in supply chain. It was written about two weeks ago. Um, and rather than share all of that here, I'd suggest you go and have a look at that on the blog. And we're going to be providing that quarterly. 
Um, the other thing is you might want to jump onto our YouTube channel, Supply Chain Secrets, um, and we're about to hit a little milestone there. So we have all sorts of topics, and Trent is one of our stars on that YouTube channel. Um, and we last time we did a webinar, which was a while ago, we had 20,000 subscribers on that channel. We've now got 55. I think we'll hit 55 today. So um, thank you for all of your support on that. Do jump on there. There's lots of great information. It's not a salesy channel at all. Uh, now, just as a bit of a thank you before uh, we get to the questions, if you've been on our webinars before, you will know uh, that we love integrating charity giving into everything that we do. 10% of our profits actually goes to charity, but we like to reward people's support for joining us on these webinars. And what have we done today for everybody on the webinar? We have planted a tree in India. So we've had a few hundred people on these webinars today. Um, so lots and lots of trees planted. That's our way of saying thank you for coming along. And if you go to your control panel on the handouts, you can actually download that certificate. Okay, then your questions. Now that's the important bit. We've got a few here. Are you ready? Um, so businesses are looking for new shipping providers and freight forwarders. Is now a good time to tender or should we hold off a bit longer? Uh now is a good time to start talking to sales teams. Typically, it's a bad time to actually release the RFT. Um, if you look it's at the pre -Christmas. way, of, yeah, pre-Christmas. So what we uh, what we like to do, what we recommend certainly, is begin engaging with them, talking about doing the collaboration part, understanding the service they offer, understanding what they're looking for for their key clients, and making sure that you are on their mind and on their you know so they're thinking about you when the tenders are starting to come out. We would normally look at releasing tenders to market sometime around November uh, with a due date late January. So give them plenty of time uh, because it is a busy time for the shipping companies. But whereas we used to expect companies to be locking in their rates in April and therefore tendering sometime around January with a, re with a recovery in February, if you wait that long, there will be no capacity left if we see a continuation of what we're seeing. That being said, as I mentioned, we are expecting to see, because the because the, the congestion is starting to ease, uh, the demand has dropped, et cetera, there's more capacity, the container issue, they released five and a half million containers into the market, uh, five and a half million TU worth of containers into the market last year. Uh, those things have all started to having an impact, therefore, we are expecting the recovery to start uh, in late Q1 or Q2 2023. Um, and so we do want to make sure that uh, you're, you, know, you are well positioned in early Q1 for your freight needs, um, but I wouldn't be releasing it now because you won't get any attention because we're just going into peak. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, this, this one's a bit of wishful thinking, I think. Are oh, the government's not doing anything to keep a cap on the ridiculous shipping rates? <laughs> that's that's <laughs> What's great. You know what, everyone asks me that question. And, and let me provide the response that was, uh, that was given to the French government by the president and the owner and president of CMA CGM. Why should we give you a helping hand when we were going bankrupt, you didn't bail us out? Yeah, and so shipping is, is one of those ones where no one wants to know about it until they're on the pain side. And no one was willing to listen to the carriers when they were hurting, so it's unlikely the carriers will bow. And as an industry, they have huge political power. Um, so no, I don't think, and I don't think it's the government's position too. I think as consumers, we need to accept the fact that we are in this position because of our own commoditizing buying needs or buying desires, and yeah, the carriers are just trying to. Yeah. <laughs> what was that? Sorry. Whose side are you on here? <laughs> well, that's, I, that's an objective view. That's an objective. Yeah, I try view. and I try and sit in the middle because I've obviously come from the shipping industry, but now most of my most of my uh, are, uh, most of my clients are shippers and, and beneficial cargo owners. So I'm, I'm trying to sit in the middle and see both sides of it. I, th I think this next question you might want to reach out to Trent. And in, f in fact, if anyone's got any questions, um, Trent Morris is the name on the bottom of the screen there. Reach out to Trent uh, either on LinkedIn or something, and, and we'll be sending you an email in the next couple of days. But this one's a little bit curly. Uh, actually, we don't have the option to negotiate with ocean liners uh, for two years with spot buys and charter carriers and fixed bookings. Um, 
all of this triggers them looking at land bridges and air bridges and transrail options. Uh, you know, this, this poor guy's kind of wondering, you know, what's going to be happening in, in the future? Have you got a crystal ball? You know, what should we be doing? Look, that's I think it is, it is going to it it will settle. There's there's no doubt. You know, as as the global economy slows down, demand will drop, supply and demand will begin to balance, and everything will start to sort itself out. There's no doubt that that's going to happen. Um, in your particular situation, not understanding, you know, this is just very much a general comment. Um, you know, if you aren't able to uh, get any sort of strength with the shipping lines, then I would be looking at uh, either working in a wholesale model and buying from uh, parties that do have strength with the shipping lines, or maybe consider onshoring. Um, there are a lot of good manufacturers in both countries, uh, in, in all countries, that can uh, do the type of work that most people need. And every day I'm surprised at what type of industry manufacturing is available in the countries we do work in. And, and I don't think Rob mentioned it, but you know, we're, we've because of COVID and everything going online, we've been doing some work in amazing places that we've never potentially done it before, Pakistan and Mongolia and yeah, Argentina and, and all sorts of places. Argentina's been big this year, yes. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and it's it's amazing what manufacturing capabilities out there. So maybe you need to look at an onshoring model if you're just not having any success in international That's logistics. That's good. I, I'm just very conscious of time, but um, what we do on these webinars, we will not go until all the questions are answered. So uh, what's the benefit of using a few forwarders at once, or is it better to stick to one, bettering that relationship? Oh, uh, this is a tough one because it's very much systems driven. Uh, unless you have the internal capacity to handle more than one uh, API slash EDI, what my preferred operating model, and depending on your volume, obviously, is to work with multiple carriers and a single freight forwarder. Uh, the freight forwarder then provides all the systems, they provide the consolidation, they provide the potentially the offshore distribution centers, the visibility, the vendor management, the PO management, et cetera. And, but you're not locked into them from a freight perspective. And certainly uh, this works very well um, in when you've got a bit more volume. Typically the carriers don't want to carry any more than uh, any less than one TU per uh, week. That's their that's their cutoff of what they're interested in, and so I like to get my big volume. You know, that's more than one TU per week with the carriers, and then I give the rats and mice to the freight forwarders, and I really don't even ask them for a price on that because you know typically that's the less than a, a half of a most most companies' volume, um, and so that that just becomes a little extra profit for them. But really, where freight forwarders excel and they really shine is those those systems that provide things like visibility, control, et cetera. Uh, that being said, some of the big carriers are starting to do a single, sim, similar model, but the challenge is then you are locked in with a single carrier. Uh, and, uh, and if they're having issues, then so are you. So that's the, the, you know, there's definitely benefits of the freight forwarder model. I don't like using multiple freight forwards unless you've got distinct parts of the business uh, so I work for a, for a big FMCG uh, who really did have two distinct parts of the business and we had a freight forwarder for each one, but each division had one freight forwarder. Uh, and yeah, we just had to manage the synergies internally. Yeah, uh, that's good advice. Okay, we've gone over a little bit because we had lots of questions. So uh, I think we'll call a halt there. If you have any more burning questions, do reach out to Trent. Uh, we'll shoot you an email anyway, so you can contact us if you have questions or need some help with anything. Um, we will see you next time. I'm not sure what the topic's going to be, but in another three months, we'll do another quarterly update and we'll be sharing uh, another topic full of tips and insights. So thank you for joining us. So I hope that was useful. If you would like to see some of these webinars live, let me just share a couple of links with you. We'll put them up here. Uh, firstly, so that you can register to see these webinars and we do them currently once a quarter uh, on really sort of uh, topical subjects. Uh, so just 
grab the link there. Uh, the other thing that I think you'll probably find useful if you haven't found it already is we record all of these webinars and we put them on the Logistics Bureau website. So let's put that link up here as well. And so you can dive in and find all kinds of topics in detail, a lot more detail than we do in the videos on this channel. So I hope that was useful. Uh, if you like the idea of sharing the sort of longer format of these recorded webinars, just let me know down below and we'll do more of it. Uh, if you have a particular challenge in ocean freight, by all means reach out to us and we can probably help you with that as well. I'll put a, a link in the, the description under the video and also in the comments if you want to get hold of us. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.